Hi, everyone. I, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you're all keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from. Um, I'm Colin Godfrey, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm a senior counsel in the employment team at Ada Lessing. Uh, let me introduce you to your speakers today. We've got um, Helen Farr, who's recently joined as a partner in the team. Helen? Hi, Colin, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be here at uh, Taylor Westing and as Colin said I'm a new partner in the team I joined uh, about a month ago and I'm really looking forward to being here uh, at my first Beehive webinar and to discussing some of the new changes that were introduced earlier this month um, and I hope as Colin said that you're all keeping well and staying safe. Thanks Helen. Uh, we've also got Joe Aston who's a senior associate in the employment team. Joe? Thanks Colin. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Looking forward to talking through a few employment law issues that aren't coronavirus related for once. It's, uh, it's a bit of a change to, to normal, so looking forward to ch chatting through a few things with you guys. Thanks, Joe. And as our uh, special guest star, we've got Hadassah Shulman from our pensions team. Hadassah. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this uh, rather grey afternoon. Um, and I'm always excited to talk to people about pensions. Thanks, Adassa. So um, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, um, as Joe says, I know that um, COVID-19 has been dominating the news for a couple of months now, and I've no doubt that it's occupied a lot of you and uh, a lot of what you've been working on. Uh, but that's really why we wanted to use this opportunity to talk about something else, because perhaps reassuringly or ominously, as the case may be, the employment world has kept on turning, and there have been some important changes and developments over the past few months. Now, as many of you know, the 6th of April is a bit of a watershed moment for employment lawyers in the UK. It's the moment we all wait for as a raft of new legislation comes into force, and you'll be pleased to know that the 6th of April this year was no different. So uh, you'll see the contents on the slide in front of you. Um, Joe's going to be kicking us off with details of the changes to mandatory information that employees and now workers need to be given when they start work. He'll also be discussing changes to the way holiday pay now gets calculated. Uh, then we're going to be uh, hearing from Helen, who's going to talk us through the new right to parental bereavement even pay and some important changes to the way that settlement payments are treated for tax purposes, as well as the annual change in tribunal limits. She'll also be talking about the topic that was on every employment lawyer's mind before coronavirus, and that's IR35. And um, then if we've got time before Boris Johnson appears for the 5 p.m. daily briefing on the telly, but not on this webinar, uh, I'll then do a roundup of the best of the rest at the end. And throughout the webinar, we're going to have Adassa uh, chipping in with some priceless pearls of pension wisdom as we go. Uh, now, as... Um, Many of you know the, the these Beehive series of seminars originated as uh, breakfast seminars in our London office, and uh, I know the idea of everyone sitting in the same room now seems a lifetime ago. Uh, but nonetheless, for those of you who've been to our events before, we've always been keen to create some discussion and a bit of debate. Uh, now, I know that's a little bit more difficult on a webinar, but I hope we can still use today as a bit of a question and answer session. So I'll do my best impression of a capable moderator, compare slash DJ. Uh, and I'd love it if you take the opportunity to ask your own questions as we go. Now you'll see, I hope, at the bottom of the screen, something uh, with a tab called Q&A. Um, if you click on that, that should open up a new screen for you to then chip in with any questions you may have. Uh, so do feel free to pop some questions in as we go, and I'll try and pick them up. And of course, if we run out of time, we will pick up any questions we don't get a chance to answer at the end. So without further ado, let me ask the first question to Joe. Joe, so what's changed about the information that employers have to give to their staff when they now start work? Thanks, Colin. Uh, hi, guys. So as many of you will probably know, there's a certain amount of information already which you need to provide to employees either before they start work or shortly after they start work. Um, the way that that's provided is often called a Section 1 statement because uh, the requirement derives from Section 1 of the Employment Rights Act. In reality, where that information tends to be is in an employment contract, although it doesn't need to be. Uh, now, obviously, a bread and butter piece of work for, for employment lawyers is drafting 
um, good employment contracts, which will go much further than providing the minimum information that's required under Section 1. Um, but I guess the point there is that it doesn't need to be an employment contract, but there does need to be a statement um, which provides minimum information. And until the 6th of April this uh, year, that was things like uh, the date on which employment began, how much the employee will be paid, uh, their entitlement to holiday and sick pay, all the sort of key pieces of information. Um, until the 6th of April, that only applied to employees. The first change, which uh, is, has taken effect with effect on the 6th of April, is that that um, requirement to provide a Section 1 statement or certain minimum amount of information about uh, the terms of engagement or employment will now apply to workers as well as employees. So if you have casual workers, uh, zero, hour, zero hours workers who are not employees, um, then th that requirement will now apply to all workers as well as employees. The second main change which has taken effect with effect from the 6th of April is that there's a, an extension to the amount of information that needs to be provided in that statement. Um, so the additional things which now need to be included um, are the days of the week the worker is required to work um, and also whether the hours are variable. So often prior to 6th of April, an employment contract would often refer to the number of hours uh, to be worked. So it could say 40 hours per week, for example, but wouldn't always say which days um, the employee was required to work. It's now a requirement that you actually specify which days um, they will be required to work or will likely be required to work. Obviously, if the, ex the expectation is that that will be variable depending on the week or the month, then you need to put as much detail in there about um, what the expectations are about the days to be worked. The second additional thing to be included in this statement is uh, uh, terms and conditions relating to paid leave which are not holiday. So that basically will summarise things like the right to maternity, you know, paid maternity leave, paternity leave, all those kind of family-friendly rights, which would not necessarily be uh, included previously, and there wasn't necessarily a legal obligation to. But there is a requirement now to include that uh, in the Section 1 statement. A, the, there also needs to be a, a statement of any benefits um, there, would, there was always a requirement um, to provide details of things like uh, uh, pensions, for example, but any additional benefits that are, that are due to be uh, provided to the employee now needs to be provided in, in the statement to the extent you know that. Um, and there also needs to be details of any probationary period. So, again, this is something which historically would have been a sort of optional thing to include, whether there's a probationary period and the terms relating to it. Um, but now, if there is going to be a probationary period, uh, a, a, a reference to that and the terms which apply to it needs to be included. We, we don't have any case law on it yet, but I mean, realistically, if there is no probationary period, to be safe, you would probably want to be clear that that is the case, just to make sure you're complying with that obligation. And then the final sort of broad uh, additional thing that needs to be included is, is details of any training that will be provided to the employee and whether that is um, obligatory training or optional and as much detail about the training which might be offered to the employee as possible. That sort of summarises the additional points which need to be included. Um, Joe, just pausing there for a second, we've had a question in yeah. already. Um, is this um, something that needs to be uh, included or amended in existing employees' contracts or is it just for uh, any employees starting from the 6th of April this year? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the requirement is only for any new starters with effect from 6th of April this year. The, the, the two potential ex exceptions to that is, are that, firstly, an employee has the ability to request an up-to-date statement. So if an existing employee expressly requests a statement, then uh, you are required to provide it, and that has to then meet the um, the broader requirements of, of the of the new Section One requirements. The second point is that under the Employment Rights Act, there's also a requirement to keep people update, keep employees updated about their terms. So if um, things are changing, 
uh, then those not a notification of those changes need to be made to all existing employees as well as being included in the statements for uh, new employees and workers as well. Fantastic. And, and uh, there's been a change as well about when this information needs to be provided as well. Yeah, that's right. So whilst in, in the majority of cases for employees, you know, best practice has always been to make sure uh, the employment contract is provided and ideally signed before uh, an employee even starts work. Strictly speaking, the Section 1 statement uh, historically only needed to be provided within two months of the start date and actually only applied to employees who had at least one month's uh, service. Both of those things are being removed now. So um, it's effectively a day one right in terms of both. It applies to everyone from the first day of their employment and there isn't a sort of grace period uh, during which you can provide the information. Um, there are certain provisions which you can potentially provide later, such as pensions, pension rights. Um, so there are certain limited things which can be provided later on, which tend to be the things which you might not necessarily know at the, at the, at the start date. But in terms of the general requirement to provide a Section 1 statement, that kicks in uh, with effect from, from day one. Fantastic. And uh, just another question that's just come in, in terms of the detail on the training, um, how much detail do, you, um, do we expect there to be required to be included in, um, in statements? Would it be just mandatory training uh, that's required for employees to, to comply with uh, their obligations as employees, or is it covering things broader than that, things like uh, companies that have got a training budget that they may, um, uh, they may roll out training from time to time to start? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't have a huge amount of guidance on that. Certainly, if there is training which is absolutely required before an employee can start their, uh, their employment, so regulatory training that's absolutely necessary for someone to do their role, you would definitely include that. I think that the rule of thumb is include as much as you possibly can about the expectations around optional training. But obviously, if something is not sort of uh, materially in your expectation uh, to be provided, then there wouldn't be an obligation to specify that. Um, so yeah, but provide as much information as you possibly can and certainly anything that is mandatory, you would want to uh, include details of that. And also making clear, uh, you know, who, who bears the cost of that training as well. Fantastic. Um, and I think there's, there's loads of questions coming in, so thank you everybody for posing questions. I'm conscious that we want to make sure we cover everything. Um, so uh, perhaps this is now the point to just move on to um, Hadassah. Just in terms of the way that this impacts on pensions, what sort of pensions issues come up uh, in relation to the provision of Section 1 statements? As uh, Joe mentioned, uh, we in pensions like to uh, have our own special rules. So um, I'm sure you're all aware that before the 6th of April, you were already required to include written details about available pension contributions and what pension schemes were in place. Um, from the 6th of April, you don't need to put this in your day one document. Um, it just needs to be in a reasonably accessible other document. And for that purpose, Theoretically, you have up to two months to provide the information. Um, but I'm sure none of you have forgotten your automatic enrolment requirements, which uh, cut across that. Um, because if you've got eligible employees, within six weeks of their start date, you're going to need to tell them either that you've auto-enrolled them or that they've been postponed. Um, and in order to do that, you're going to need to tell them about the pension scheme and their contributions. Um, so really the time limit you've got for providing information on pensions is the auto-enrolment six-week one. Fantastic. Thanks, Hadassah. So um, changing tack a little, um, we're going to move on to everyone's favourite topic, obviously, which is how to calculate holiday pay. Um, Joe, what, what's changed in relation to this? Thanks, Colin. Um, we could probably do a whole webinar on the calculation of holiday pay, so um, we need to focus a little bit on this specific change for the time being. But I mean, just to very, very briefly um, discuss some of the sort of history of it, as people may well be aware, there's been 
quite a lot of case law in the pre in, in recent years um, about what should be included in the calculation of holiday pay. Um, the very very much the standard practice for a lot of employers tends to be well we'll just we'll just pay um, a day's pay based on a basic salary, uh, and, and and realistically a lot of employers are still doing that. The case law essentially in a nutshell, if it, if it's possible to to do that, um, says that uh, you need to take into account when calculating holiday pay any payments that are intrinsically linked to the work that they're doing. So a classic example is commission. If someone um, part is part of someone's pay is commission uh, and regular commission, then that should be taken into account when calculating someone's pay when they go on holiday, um, rather than paying just the basic pay. Uh, and this covers things like overtime as well, most types of overtime. Um, so there are situations where an employee might have variable pay because they, they, they receive pay such as commission or overtime. There may also be situations where an employee, uh, there are hours are variable, so they don't do the same number of hours per week. And therefore, it's not possible to pay uh, their holiday based on the sort of standard uh, basic uh, daily rate. Now, that's all sort of uh, the background. The change which has taken place uh, with or has taken place with effect on the 6th of April is to do with the, uh, the reference period. So until the 6th of April, when you are looking to calculate that um, payment of holiday pay, which involves uh, sort of adding up their pay over a period and then dividing it out to then uh, find a daily rate which should be paid for the holiday. The previous reference period was 12 weeks. So you, it, once someone goes on holiday, you look back 12 weeks, you average out the total amount of pay that they've received over that 12-week period, and then you get an average daily rate, which they should be paid while, for that day's holiday. Now, the problem with that, which was raised by a number of industries particularly, was that it doesn't account for seasonal uh, variance and, uh, and changes. So if you've got someone who's in a sales role where certain times of the year are very, very busy, uh, and certain times of the year aren't. So, I mean, I can give you the, the example of my brother who sells skiing holidays. Obviously, certain times of the year are much more busy than others when you're selling skiing holidays. Um, so, because of this, the, the risk of uh, the variance in pay having an effect on people's uh, holiday pay, a change has been made so that the reference period from the 6th of April needs to be a 52-week period, so the whole year prior to uh, the date on which that person goes on holiday. So you, you can see that, that that evens out the, the variation of uh, pay over the year. And the aim is to make it fairer uh, and avoid, for example, employers uh, forcing people to go on holiday at times when their pay may be lower because they're not earning so much commission and therefore um, they will be receiving less uh, less holiday pay. So the change is very small. The issue is quite a big one, and it's something which we advise clients on a lot, and it's something which actually a lot of clients are, are, are not paying enough attention to in terms of making sure that they pay holiday at the right level. Um, but the change is a, is, a, is a small one, albeit uh, has quite a big impact. So you just need to be bearing in mind that when you're doing these calculations that it's a, it's a, it's a whole year that you should be looking back rather than just a 12-week period. And Joe, I mean, how variable does someone with variable pay have to be? Uh, is it enough to just uh, for someone who gets a bonus once a year, or does it need to be more uh, more of a, a substantial variation than that? Yeah, so it generally has to be pay which is is intrinsically linked to the work that they're doing. So certainly not company wide bonuses; they wouldn't be counted. But anything which is intrinsic to the work they're doing. So uh, it's possible that uh, bonuses paid uh, over the year could be included, although an annual bonus probably not. Um, but certainly things like commission and overtime should all be included when doing that calculation. Great, thank you. And um, Adassa, are there knock-on implications for um, calculating pension contributions? I think I'm going to give the uh, least surprising answer of the webinar right now, um, which is, uh, yes, um, if pay is going up because of the 52-week uh, reference period, then you're going to end up paying higher contributions. Um, it's also uh, 
really important to remember that you can't encourage people to opt out. So even though um, this change might well lead to higher contributions, um, it isn't something that you should be uh, communicating to people about um, in a separate way um, to try and get them to make other pension decisions. <laughs> Great. Um, there have been some a couple of other really great questions, but um, as I say, I'm just keen to make sure we keep the time. If we've got time at the end, we'll pick them up. But if not, I say, I'm very happy that we can follow up with you each individually. But um, let's just move on to um, something which perhaps is actually long overdue, which is parental bereavement leave and pay. Um, let me pass over to Helen now. So Helen, what's the new parental bereavement leave and pay and how, how does it work? Thanks, Colin. Well, the parental bereavement leave regulations were passed um, in January this year, but they actually take effect from the 6th of April. And it's a way of supporting those parents who suffer the devastating loss of a child. Um, many of you would have seen the regulations referred in the press as Jack's Law, and that's because they were the result of a tireless campaign by a mother, Lucy Hurd, who sadly lost her son, Jack. And one point just to be proud of is that in the UK, we have the most generous scheme of parental bereavement leave in the world. So that's, that's obviously good news for, for the country and for our employees. Um, this new right gives your employees the right to take two weeks leave following the death of a child. Um, and I set out the test that will apply in terms of who qualifies. Um, by intended parents, Colin, what we mean by that is someone who's applying for surrogacy. Clearly, it follows the, um, it will only apply following the death of a child during employment and a child has to be someone under 18 or stillborn from 24 weeks uh, gestation. And Helen, how would an employee go about actually taking the leave? Well, leave, it's actually quite a flexible scheme, Colin. Um, leave can be taken either in one block of two weeks or two individual blocks of one week. And the government has allowed employees uh, the flexibility to take that leave within a, a year of a child's dying. And the thinking behind that is that employees may want to take some time immediately following the bereavement, but then perhaps commemorate the child's passing a year after they, they, they've died. Um, so the employee would have the flexibility to do that if they want to. As you'd expect, employees have to give notice to take the leave, but interestingly, there's no requirement that that notice is in writing. The employee simply has to give it information about when they want the leave to start, whether they plan to take a block of one or two weeks, and sadly, the date when their child died. Um, the employee, again, I think building on this, this, this desire that the scheme shouldn't be overly bureaucratic, can take uh, leave immediately um, if the request for leave is made within eight weeks of death. Um, there's only a requirement to notice if they're applying for leave more than eight weeks after the baby's died. Thanks, Helen. And um, will staff get paid for periods of bereavement leave? Well, interestingly, under the statutory scheme, um, they will, staff will only qualify for paid statutory uh, parental bereavement pay if they've got six months qualifying service. And that leave um, is paid at, at similar rates to statutory maternity pay. So the current rate would be the lower of either 151 20 a week or 90% of average weekly earnings. Do be aware that workers may also qualify for statutory parental bereavement pay if they've got six months service and their earnings level are sufficient to qualify. So I guess that takes us to the key question, which is what uh, our employer clients should be considering doing at the moment to prepare for all of this. Yeah, absolutely, Colin. And I think the starting point has to be that employers should obviously um, draft a bereavement policy um, and that should really set out in detail what the new entitlement is, how it applies and who will qualify. And I think when you're drafting that type of policy, it's a really good way to show how committed you are to your staff um, 
and the support that you would want to offer anyone who's suffering a bereaved, who's bereaved and suffering a loss. Um, do be sensitive to the notice requirements. Um, don't be tempted to sort of force employees to give more, more notice than, than is required under the statutory scheme. Um, another point that needs to be considered is um, payment of enhanced bereavement pay. Clearly, because employees won't qualify for the first six months under the statutory scheme, you may choose to pay salary or some payment if, if, if an employee were to sadly lose a child in that period. Um, in addition, if you're paying staff um, already some sort of compassionately, perhaps for a week, you may want to mirror that entitlement in this scenario too. I think because it is such a positive development, um, I think it's a really good opportunity for you to go out there and communicate this change to staff. Um, make sure, obviously, that your managers are aware of it so that they know that it's right that anyone in their team who may be suffering a bereavement can avail themselves of. And make sure that people understand that in those limited circumstances I've explained, workers may qualify for statutory bereavement pay. Do also think about other ways, uh, other rights to leave, um, which would include um, obviously time off to care for dependents, Sadly, that under the statutory scheme, that's unpaid, but it's still, it's still an opportunity for employees um, to, to, to use and to take that type of leave. And also think about ways that you can support anyone who's suffering a bereavement. And I think probably at this time, more than any, um, that's a really positive message to be giving to your staff. You know, you may have a, a fantastic employee assistance programme. You may be able to offer counselling or more, just more bespoke support. Think about those measures. Um, and there's a really good ACAS guide that I would refer you to that, that will give you some sort of guidance if that's something you're interested in. Thanks, Helen. And um, Hadassah, jumping back to you, is, um, what happens to pension contributions during a period of parental bereavement leave? Yeah, this is um, another one of those um, generous elements of, of this that uh, Helen mentioned. So um, employees who are on parental bereavement leave are entitled to all of the other terms and conditions that aren't pay as if they're still at work. Um, so that means their pension contributions should continue. Um, and if you've got any salary sacrifice arrangement in place, um, you should continue to pay those employer contributions as well. Um, so that means that the, the employee is still having that continuation um, even during this, this period of leave, um, which uh, I agree with, with Helen is a really, really positive um, change for people. Thanks, Adassa. Um, so from one uh, very positive development to another which is um, has been long uh, planned uh, but is uh, on the slightly less positive side and um, it's about tax uh, please don't all switch off at once um, Helen uh, how have these recent tax changes impacted on employee settlement payments Thanks, Colin. Why is it whenever we talk about tax, it's always slightly bad news? Um, the slightly sad news is that if you are planning or you, you need to make a, a termination payment to someone after the 6th of April, which exceeds the £30,000 um, level, then you are going forward expected to pay employer national insurance contribution on that amount that exceeds £30,000. So I think it's really important that you don't forget this change. It's quite a small change. Obviously, it will have quite an impact. Um, and do make sure that when you're doing your uh, cash flow projection um, or budgeting for terminations, you do remember to include that additional 13.8% on the excess over above the £30,000 uh, cash-free amount, sorry, tax-free amount that you can pay by way of termination payment. And Adassa, is there a way of making settlement payments any more tax efficient for employees by utilising uh, payments into a pension scheme instead? Uh, yes, yes, there is. And uh, it's nice to be the person coming with some good news. Um, so because uh, employer pension contributions are not subject to um, 
national insurance contribution, you could make a payment to someone's pension scheme as an employer contribution um, as part of their termination payment. Um, that will depend on the individual's personal tax circumstances. Um, there's only a maximum amount that you can save into a pension in a tax efficient way. Um, so there's uh, a yearly allowance for what you can uh, save, which for um, most employees um, is £40,000, but that tapers down for your higher paid employees down to only £4,000. So um, for those really, really big settlements, you might find that your um, employee doesn't have a tax allowance that can help. Um, there is also a lifetime allowance, which again is going to affect um, your highest paid employees um, because it's the amount that you can save into pension tax efficiently over your, your whole time, um, which is just over a million pounds. Um, so you know, it's not going to solve every, every situation, but it, it should help for quite a number of, of terminations. Thanks, Adas. So we're, we're racing through. Um, so next up, we've got uh, statutory increases. Um, now, as many of you know, these things happen uh, once a year. And Helen, do you want to take us through um, what the uh, limits have gone up to this year? And building on what Joe was talking about earlier in terms of Section 1 statements, I know that there are penalties potentially payable uh, for a failure to provide those. What sort of level would those be paid at? Yeah, thanks, Colin. Absolutely. As, as uh, Colin said, these, uh, the, the, the tribunal awards do increase every April um, to gain a, a little bit of bad news for employers. Um, and the current rate or the new rate for a compensatory award, um, if an in individual brings a claim for unfair dismissal, has just gone up now to £88,519. Um, the value of a claim for basic award, again, from their dismissal, has increased to 16140 And that's particularly relevant because um, that's the same amount as an individual would, would must be paid uh, by way of a statutory redundancy payment. That's the maximum uh, statutory redundancy payment uh, too. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious that that's going to be quite relevant for, for some of you listening at the moment. And... Uh, it's also important that you remember that the value of a week's pay under the statutory scheme has increased to £538. And again, that's relevant for when you are calculating statutory redundancy payments in particular. Um, Joe's spoken about the new requirements to give a Section 1 statement. Um, and I think it's important just to highlight how much um, a claim would be worth. Um, the starting point is that the minimum value of a claim would be two weeks' pay at the statutory rate, which is about £1,076. Um, a tribunal can, though, if it considers it's just and equitable to do so, increase that to £2,152. So by itself, it's not that significant. But as Joe said, if, if, if you have a number of employees uh, for whom you've not given the right details, it can well add up. And had that so any impact on the pension side here? I'm uh, stretching the title here a little bit um, and focusing on tribunals because um, there's been a recent trend of more auto enrolment complaints going to the pensions ombudsman. Um, and whilst there is a question over jurisdiction, so it is it's always worth looking at the precise complaint, um, there is another forum that employers could find themselves um, having a dispute in. Um, and the pensions on Brisbane can make sure that an employer pays the right amount, but there's also the ability to order distress and convenience payments. Um, and those can be quite high Particularly recently, we're seeing more complaints where the distress and inconvenience payment is around the £2,000 mark. So um, it's important just not to forget that, that that's another um, forum where employees can um, go and raise complaints. 
Fantastic, thanks, Hadassah. Um, so, lastly, on uh, the I suppose the the most recent changes, um, IR35. Helen, I thought this had all been delayed, so surely we can all forget about this for now, can't we? Well, you're right to an extent, Colin, but sadly we can't forget about it. Um, as I think everyone um, listening will be aware, the government um, has, uh, pl the original plan was that the off-payroll rules or, um, would be implemented or extended to the private sector from April this year. Um, now those rules build on the IR35 regime and the objective was to mirror the um, off-payroll rules that were implemented in the public sector from 2017. Now, I just want to be clear with this, what we, uh, um, because I think there's been a bit of confusion. IR35 is not changing, but what the focus, but the focus behind these changes or plan changes is to put the burden on you as the end user of consultancy services that are provided by a, a personal services company um, onto you rather than HMRC. Um, and um, that's something that the, have, the HMRC has been struggling with for at least the last 20 years since this regime was introduced. I think the result of the plan changes was that many businesses have moved away from using consultants um, or, or through using providing services through a PSC altogether. And we've had a number of examples with uh, Lloyds and Barclays um, as being quite high profile names that have publicly come out and said, we're just not using this regime. Um, I think because of all of those issues, the regime has been incredibly controversial. And um, from the end of last month, we had, a, as Colin has said, the, the government sort of announced, but slightly under the radar, that it plans to delay the implementation of this regime for another year. Uh, because of the COVID pandemic. And of course, that's been something that's been welcomed with open arms by business. But the position has been compounded, Colin, because as of Monday this week, the House of Lords um, has been also looking into this uh, position and they published a report. And basically, it's incredibly critical of the government and its approach in introducing this change. The starting point is that the House of Lords welcomed this year delay. Um, it's incredibly critical of the rules. Um, it feels that it's wrong to put a burden on you um, to implement them, given everything else that's going on at the moment. And it's called for a complete rethink of the regime. Um, it asks that the government takes account of business needs. It, re it focuses on the consequences of reform. Um, in particular, I think it's mindful that there's a need, if perhaps more now than ever, for you to be able to be flexible with staffing. And this change, um, if it's implemented, is just going to fetter your ability to do so. It's also incredibly critical of the impact on contractors of the change, um, because the view is that you know what what it's forcing uh, is, is a change that contractors are treated as employees for tax purposes but they don't have the benefits and the same uh, status as employees within your business. And I think good news for many of you who have uh, tried to use it, it's also been incredibly critical of the theft tool, um, which, as I said, if anyone out there has, has tried to use it, I'm sure will, will resonate and uh, really strike a chord with you. So the House of Lords conclusion in that report is that the government should implement the Taylor Review um, and basically, um, that, that's the best solution to ensure a consistent approach between the way that um, you know, employees are taxed and uh, that there should be better rights from self-employed. So, so, so I think... Sorry, go ahead. So I think in terms of answering your original question, which is whether it's safe to delay preparing for the implementation of your payroll rules, um, which lots of people have been asking us. I think sadly the answer is no. And the reason for that is that it's likely um, we anticipate that the government will still push forward with this regime next year. And I think the reason for that, there's a number of reasons, but I think the reason is that you know, it is working to a fashion anyway in the public sector. The government's view is it's consulted and consulted on this regime. And it's a good stopgap 
pending a further review from the House of Lords. Also, I think at the moment, given everything else that's happening in the world, you know, HMRC is incredibly busy, um, in particular measuring things like furlough, and I don't think it's going to have the bandwidth to make significant changes. Um, also, the government needs the, the sort of additional tax revenue that will be generated potentially by implementing this change. Now, one of the key points that the House of Lords did um, make in its conclusion is it called the government to come up with a statement to business in October, um, an announcement about whether they will be implementing the payroll rules in April 2021, or whether they will allow a further significant review. And I still think um, until we know the position in October and what the future is going to hold for these rules, um, you do need, still need to proceed on the basis that they will be coming in next April um, and make sure certainly that two things, that you don't allow a, a, any arrangements to be in place that will extend beyond the end of this year um, and that you proceed on the basis that the new regime will be applying from April 2021. Thanks, Helen. And, and Hadassah, just on the pension side, um, how once this is in place, how would this impact on, on the obligation to um, make pension contributions? Yeah, that's an um, interesting question, Colin. I think the key point to remember to start with is that there is a different definition um, for the purposes of IR35 of um, who's um, caught um, by the employment tax versus who is a worker or employee for employment rights purposes. Um, but certainly some uh, clients have been finding that when they've done the tax analysis, um, they've found people who fall within the worker employee category. Um, and if you come across those people as part of doing this analysis, it's, it's important to remember that um, if they're going to be a, a worker or an employee for employment purposes, um, in all likelihood they are for pension purposes, um, and therefore automatic enrolment um, needs to be considered. Um, you're going to need to meet your duties for anyone who is eligible going forward. Um, but also there's a question about what to do with the past if these people were workers um, before but were misclassified and um, making sure they haven't missed out on their pension rights for the past as well so you could have a few few thorny issues um, in other areas coming out of your analysis for IR35 purposes. Thanks Adassa and just before we move on Helen this question has come in um, is there a, a time limit uh, on which you can reliably engage somebody as a contractor um, without having to worry about uh, whether or not they are, uh, what their status is for IR35 purposes, or is it the case that um, uh, you always need to make sure you're clear on their, their status before you, and, and engage them on the correct basis from the, from the outset? Well, I think the position is that the, the IR35 rules are still in place, um, and so you could still, but, but the, the new of payroll working rules um, which require you to undertake that assessment about whether the the, consult, the contractor is, um, you know, they're an employee that, that you should end up paying uh, tax for their services. That's clearly going to be delayed until April 2021. So you could, I think, at the moment, still proceed on the normal R35 basis. Um, so you can engage them um, as a consultant. Um, assuming that they are genuinely a consultant, but it would be important to make sure that that contractual arrangement doesn't go beyond uh, certainly the 6th of April next year, and it would be good to sort of perhaps have a termination date, I would say at least a month before. Um, but don't forget, obviously, there are still the kind of the, the, the current IR35 regime does still apply to that, that contractual arrangement, so you do still need to be confident that they are still genuinely contractual, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Helen. Um, Thanks. So uh, the last bit is um, just a few points from me to, uh, I say, wrap up perhaps the, the best of the rest that's been uh, around 
over the last uh, few months. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was a government response to consultation that was published earlier this year. Um, I, government consultation, I hear you all say, but I mean, this is potentially significant, so do bear with me. Um, it relates to the rights of those who are returning from a period of family leave, and uh, perhaps it seeks to address what many see as a gap in the existing protections avoided to uh, women who take a period of mat leave. Uh, now, as I'm sure many of you already know, uh, women on maternity leave do currently benefit from additional protection where they are uh, put at risk of redundancy whilst on that leave. Um, and in, this, in essence, it basically requires that they're given a right of first refusal in respect of any suitable and appropriate alternative employment. Um, now, the issue has always been that uh, the, the, that's all well and good in respect of the period of the maternity leave, but obviously there are uh, significant periods both before and after uh, where that same protection simply at the moment doesn't apply and what the, um, the government has committed to doing at some point when it gets the time who knows when that might be uh, to extending this protection from the point at which the employee informs their employer that she's pregnant whether or not that's in, or, in um, orally or in writing and um, think through how difficult that might be for you as an employer to, um, to know whether or not uh, an employee might have told one of your staff that um, it, orally that they're pregnant, but perhaps that has not fed back to, um, uh, to HR or the powers that be. Uh, so that'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, they're also committing to extending the protection for six months once a new mother has returned to work from maternity leave and also from when a primary adopter returns from adoption leave. Um, I mean, I think that is a, an important and, uh, and I think quite a, a sensible measure for them to put in place once that is implemented uh, on the basis that, um, as ever, there are ongoing challenges to women who have taken a period of maternity leave. And so, um, the, that protection is going to be a valuable thing. And then uh, lastly, there's also the uh, potential for extending the protection into a period following a return to work for those who take a period of shared parental leave. Um, now that last one, I would be a little surprised to see that finding its way onto the statutory books, but um, we shall see. Um, the uh, last thing I wanted to say on this one was that for those who are taking paternity leave, I'm afraid the bad news is the government uh, has concluded that paternity leave doesn't justify the same protection. So it's business as usual for um, uh, those who take a period of paternity leave, so no additional protection for those people. And moving on to uh, vicarious liability. Now, uh, this last bit, uh, it covers two uh, almost simultaneously released Supreme Court judgments that almost passed everyone by. Um, so vicarious liability in, in short is effectively an employer's legal liability for the acts uh, and or omissions of their employees. Uh, and as this is the last topic that I want to talk about, uh, I wanted to finish with some positive news for employers because over the last decade or so, the boundaries of what employers and, and businesses can find themselves liable for has been extending quite far. And these two cases on the slide here are uh, cases which rein that in slightly, not substantially, but slightly, at least try to ensure that those boundaries aren't going out any further. The first one relates to Morrison's. Um, they were the victim, really, of a disgruntled employee, Mr. Skelton, who deliberately leaked the payroll data of about 100,000 employees uh, he did it deliberately to be mischievous and to, to cause his employer harm. Um, the lower courts found that even though he was uh, effectively acting maliciously, he, that Morrison's would still be liable in respect of any loss or damage that was caused as a result of his actions. The um, Supreme Court now reversed that decision, saying that the question is whether or not the acts of the employee are sufficiently closely connected their duties so that they can fairly and properly be regarded as done in the ordinary course of their duties. Um, here, the simple fact that Mr. Skelton, uh, his employment gave him the opportunity to do something which was itself unlawful and, uh, and wrong, 
uh, wasn't enough to warrant the imposition of you know, vicarious liability for Morrison's. Um, I should just say that um, it's always important to make sure we are conscious and cautious of data protection and GDPR obligations. And um, so even though it may not give rise uh, in this case to a, a direct liability to, uh, to those whose data was released, that doesn't change the fact that the regulator, the Information Commissioner in respect of data protection rights couldn't potentially still take action against Morriston. So um, just be aware that it's always still important to make sure that your employees are aware of their obligations to uh, ensure that uh, employee data and customer data for that matter is, um, is kept strictly uh, and sensitively maintained so that it's not leaked or, or revealed elsewhere. Uh, the second case on the slide there is Barclays Bank, and this one isn't even about an employee. Um, this is about whether or not Barclays should have been held vicariously liable for loss and damage suffered by the patient of a doctor to whom prospective employees were sent for pre-employment medical checks. Now, it's, it's not a nice case. Uh, it involves an allegation that the doctor uh, sexually assaulted a number of individuals during their medical examinations in the 60s, 70s, and, and early 1980s. Um, after the doctor died, and uh, you can sort of understand then uh, that there was nobody else for the uh, employees to get recompense from, they sought damages directly from Barclays, arguing that effectively the, the doctor was, was acting um, as if he was uh, working for Barclays. And again, in a judgment that I think will be welcomed by employers, the Supreme Court held that it is right that there is still this distinction between uh, employment and relationships which are akin to employment on the one hand, for which employers are quite properly vicariously liable, and relationships with independent, uh, genuine independent contractors on the other hand, where the party engaging with that contractor shouldn't find itself on the hook in the event that, that independent contractor is negligent or is guilty of some form of malpractice. So um, in this case, uh, the Supreme Court held that the doctor's actions were squarely in category number two. And so ultimately, it wasn't something that Barclays should be legally responsible for. So um, we've actually got a little bit of time uh, for a couple of extra questions. Um, so let me go back to the start, if I may, and ask Joe a question. Um, Joe, we had a question in, in relation to um, Section 1 statements, is it permissible for an employer to um, have all of the information required uh, contained in a variety of documents, or does it have to all be in one single document? Thanks, Colin. So uh, the majority of the information needs to be in a single document. Um, there are some exceptions uh, to that. Um, I'm just trying to decide where they are. It's basically things like um, pension plans, particulars of training, um, and certain information about disciplinary and grievances. So the majority needs to be provided in, in, in one single statement, but there are things that can be included in separate policies. So I think disciplinary and grievance is a good example of that. It is okay to say the disciplinary and grievance um, procedures are contained in a separate document um, and for example if, if details of pensions arrangements aren't available at, at, at day one they are provided um, within within two months after after the start date so it's best to include as much as possible uh, as you can in the, in the initial statement but there are a few few exceptions to the to that express rule thanks Joe and um, I, I, I... A follow up and, and perhaps an, an unlucky uh, customer on the line who says that um, uh, some employees signed up to new contracts before the 6th of April, but their start date is technically after the 6th. Um, I, I don't know, I, I guess I don't know the answer, but um, do we think that that would technically be a breach? Should they be signing new agreements or do we think it's relatively low risk? I think it's probably low risk. I think, strictly speaking, it, it, it will be from when their employment commences. Um, it shouldn't be difficult to send. Remember, it's a statement, so it's not an agreement. Um, so it would be quite easy to produce a sort of a, appendix to the initial contract, just saying, here are some additional things which weren't originally included, uh, and just send that to them um, 
a, as soon as possible just to mitigate any risk. But I, but I do agree it's probably low, low risk. Thanks, Joe. Um, and then uh, one last horrible holiday pay question. Um, when um, we're thinking about variable pay um, and perhaps the, the 12 uh, month now calculation period uh, for overtime, do we uh, just include the contractual overtime uh, or does voluntary overtime, uh, should voluntary overtime be added into the calculations as well, technically speaking? Yeah, so there is case law which um, has found that um, voluntary overtime should be included um, as long as it is taken in a sort of regular pattern um, and would be deemed normal remuneration. So any regular overtime, even if it's um, even if it's voluntary, would be included. Of course, bear in mind it's only for it to be relevant, it would have to be paid overtime. So if someone is a a salaried employee staying an hour later at work but not getting paid overtime for it, that won't be relevant. But if it is voluntary and it sort of makes up a pattern of overtime, then then there's case law to say that that should should be included in the calculation. Fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Um, and conscious of time, um, so I think that this is probably the um, the moment to to wrap up and. I say we can all um, get ready to listen to the government's daily briefing in a couple of minutes' time. So that, that just leaves me and the team to thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you do have any further questions, and if there are any questions that we didn't manage to get to, um, we will um, drop you a line. And I say, if you have questions still outstanding, do not hesitate to get in touch. Um, you'll see our friendly faces and contact details on the slide on the screen now. Um, and I know that this is um, everything but coronavirus session, but I do appreciate that it's still front and center of many of your minds. So uh, do let us know if you have any specific issues or questions around that. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, we hear on the grapevine that the government is uh, indicating and intending that when the furlough scheme does come to a close, it's going to be tapered off rather than there being some sort of hard stop. So um, once we've got a bit more detail about that, and what it might mean for you and your staff will uh, circulate an update around. So do look out for that. Um, and so that just leaves me to say thank you again for joining us. I hope you stay safe and well. Um, and as ever, if you need anything, any questions, don't hesitate to drop us a line. Thank you very much. Thank you.